Greetings. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on when and how to use heat pipes in space applications for thermal control. My name is Richard Jones and I'll be moderating the, this program today. Joining me on our left is one of our lead product development engineers, Ryan Spangler, and on our right is our sales and marketing manager, Brian Mizuka. For those of you following along today, please feel free to leave questions in the questions tab. You can also find some relevant documents in the handouts tab. Please bring up any technical issues you're experiencing in the chat tab. We'll be having a short Q&A section towards the end of the program where we'll be trying to get to as many of these questions as we can. We will follow up with, any, with an email or a phone call with any questions we do not ha have time to get to or that we need more detail for response. Now let's get into our program. Brian, before we get into the details about space heat pipes, could you discuss some general challenges encountered when designing a space system? Sure, sure. Thanks, Rick. Um, I guess before I jump in, I, I do want to kind of thank the production team here, uh, Megan, Jordan, John, Brittany, Rick, for uh, for helping us out. They put a lot of effort into this, and Ryan and I are definitely going to screw it up, so apologize for that. Um, but yeah, and my co-host, Ryan, here. Let's get going. Um, yeah, to get to your question, the considerations for space are, um, in some ways, a lot are very similar to the terrestrial considerations. So at a very high level, you want to understand your waste heat, your, your power um, that you need to get rid of. You want to understand your environment. Um, and you want to understand kind of your, your max temperatures and all the extremes you need to deal with. So the big difference there is um, the environment. So in a space system, uh, <clears throat> in a space system, you're going to be dealing with um, a lot of vacuum environments. So you can't dissipate heat to air. You need to radiate it. So a lot of the challenges are how you thermally couple everything and uh, get heat to your radiators and then size your radiators appropriate to, uh, to dissipate the heat. And there's a lot of challenges in that um, in different space environments, whether you're in orbital environment or if you're on the moon. Um, so there's a lot of different considerations that you need to really understand your mission and your environment to kind of come up with and develop a, a proper thermal solution. All right. Now, Ryan, Brian mentioned some specific environments. Could you describe some of the boundary conditions a thermal designer might see in a lunar environment? Sure. Yeah, I'll do my best. So I would say there are some definite similarities between an orbital uh, mission versus a lunar mission. Um, they're both somewhat cyclic in nature. Um, I guess one of the main differences is the duration of each cycle. So, for instance, you know, an orbit could be on the order of magnitude of 100 minutes. So, within that 100 minutes, you're fully seeing sun and you're fully in eclipse. Um, so, you don't reach a true steady state at times. Uh, you might not see the same temperature extremes on the hot and cold. Um, in a lunar environment, one rotation, I believe, is about 28, uh, 28 days. So, you'll have 14 days worth of seeing the sun and 14 days um, in the cold. And, uh, and the latter, which tends to be a significant challenge, uh, maintaining batteries to store enough survival heat uh, to prevent your electronics from getting too cold during that 14-day off period or hibernation. It's on the order of one, uh, one watt for five kilograms of batteries. So that's a major consideration. Um, the temperature extremes are, are different as well. So the radiator panels are allowed to drop very, very cold during that duration. Um, uh, C minus 150, 160, 170 uh, Celsius, and you also have some gravity uh, influences. So for a uh, orbital environment, you know, the designer needs to be cognizant of testing in 1G, but once it's actually launched and uh, circling around the planet, um, you know, it's in a microgravity environment. So they have to be less concerned about the actual orientation of the spacecraft because uh, it's not seeing the influence of gravity versus a lunar environment that's constantly under uh, you know, gravitational field, albeit about one sixth uh, that that you'd see on Earth. All right. Now, Brian, could you go into a little bit more detail about how that compares to orbital environments? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, you could tell he's he's designed some things for the moon before, um, so definitely knows that environment pretty well. But the um, yeah, in an orbital setting. A lot, a lot, same considerations, but the the differences kind of have to do, and, and Ryan alluded to a little the mission profile and how you're um, differing over time with where you're, whether you're deep space facing or you're sun facing, and I guess one consideration very early on, and and um, designers would know this, but the um, the orbital plane that you're going into. So there's there's 
a couple different um, common orbital planes. There's GEO, MEO, LEO. Um, GEO, kind of geosynchronous, was the most common um, plane for satellites um, over the past decade. Now, kind of the MEO and LEO orbits are getting a little more popular uh, because of some of the low latency data transfer. But um, yeah, GEO, in, in kind of its um, namesake, it's geosynchronous, so it keeps very common distance between the Earth and Sun. So it is somewhat easier to plan for from a thermal perspective because you are keeping kind of a common rotation and have um, very stable mission profiles. Whereas LEO, you're, you're rotating at different speeds in relation to the Earth and Sun. So you have to go through a lot of um, cyclic temperature loads as you go through those environments. Um, so yeah, some, some very similar design constraints when we're talking about lunar and orbital, but um, the, the big key is just to understand the entire mission profile and make sure you're designing to the worst case extremes um, at both the hot and cold temperature. All right, very good. So now that we're oriented with some of the environmental challenges that we're gonna see, could you talk specifically about some of the thermal challenges on board spacecraft? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so the, the thermal challenges, um, we talked about the temperature extremes, but I guess the, the driving force behind the thermal challenges is what's on board the spacecraft. And in most cases, what we're talking about there is um, cooling some sort of um, electronic device or propulsion system. So in the electronics, what you need to consider is the maximum heat flux that it's giving, the overall heat dissipation, as well as the uh, maximum and minimum case temperatures. So you need to design, uh, where in terrestrial environments, you're mainly designing to keep the electronics from overheating in kind of um, space environments, you need to also consider and plan for and control the low end temperature so that you're keeping your electronics from failing at the low temperature as well. So all those kind of go into play. Um, and from more of a global perspective, um, the, the total heat of your spacecraft is kind of dictate your, your radiator size. So you need a certain amount of radiator surface area to dissipate the entire heat load of your spacecraft. Um, so starting from there and then figuring out how to couple from the radiator to all the various electronics and um, payload devices that are gonna be located in various locations across the spacecraft is one of the biggest challenges is how to um, make all those thermal couples and also package everything in a lightweight, um, low mass um, kind of design. All right. So let's say our audience wants to get into this field. What types of tools are available when it comes to system level analysis and what challenges might they be facing? Sure. I guess first off, does our audience want to get into this field, you think? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It's a very <laughs> cool field. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, sorry. So the one tool that um, that I think we have the most familiarity familiarity with um, for space level design uh, is thermal desktop. So it's kind of the standard in the industry as far as we're concerned, and at least domestically. Um, it's a very very powerful tool. Um, you're able to input different orbital uh, parameters and have it basically calculate what the uh, what the spacecraft is seeing as it's orbiting an object or if it's on the, the regolith of the moon. Um, it can do the simple trade study. So if you're just starting off and you want to take a look at, you know, what the overall temperature stack up could be from a very theoretical standpoint, you could do that very quickly in the program. You can build it up to a full system, definitely becomes more computationally expensive. Um, in doing that, but it, it has proven to be very accurate, very powerful tool. Um, in terms of weaknesses or shortcomings, it's also not a very uh, user-friendly tool. So that generally is one of the, the larger challenges or learning curves associated with it is, um, you know, you almost need a year or two worth of experience with it before you become efficient. Um, so that is definitely one major caveat to it. All right, now that we've covered some of the tools and the environments you might be seeing, let's get into my personal favorite topic, heat pipes. One of the primary questions we get over and over is, what is the best fluid for the temperature range I'm trying to work in? So starting at the cold end and working our way to the hot end, could you describe some of the common fluids we might use in a heat pipe and what the best fit uh, for any specific temperature range might be? That is a loaded question, Rick. Uh, so there are a tremendous amount of different materials that could be used as a working fluid. And, um, 
you know, an accompanying uh, envelope material that's compatible. So rather than talk to the specifics of each one, let me just talk about it from a broad perspective. So you, at very cold operating temperatures, you can be down in like a helium as a working fluid range. Um, hot, you can be on the lithium side of things. Those are fairly uncommon as far as we're concerned. So some of the more common ones are kind of working from cold uh, to hot. You know, you have uh, methane, uh, there's ethane, propylene is seeing uh, a lot of interest in terms of some deep space facing uh, spacecraft or lunar operation. I believe then there's uh, ammonia, which is kind of the bread and butter for spacecraft uh, thermal control. There's methanol, not a tremendous amount of space flight heritage, but fits in that range. Um, then it's water, which has, you know, within the past few years uh, been space flight qualified. Um, and sees a lot of use or application more on the board or component level um, of, of uh, thermal control. Um, and then, you know, they continue to increase up to even liquid metals, which are starting to be, uh, starting to see some interest uh, for like Stirling engines uh, for, again, deep space propulsion. Um, yeah, so like a sodium working fluid. Yeah, and maybe just to build on that, I'd say um, from our customers, probably close to 95 um, and probably years ago is 100 percent are in the ammonia range it's very proven it's been up there on orbit for um, decades and and works very well especially in those applications that are kind of in orbital um, realm as kind of nasa increases budget space force comes around and and companies start exploring more there is the need for these other fluids so that's why there's a lot of kind of emerging areas um, on the fluids ryan's talking about as we start going to um, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, uh, there's going to be a lot of different working fluids necessary, but heat pipes in general kind of still provide the, the best passive operation and heat transfer mode for those type of applications. Absolutely. All right. Now, just getting to a quick question from our audience here that fits in pretty nicely with this topic. What are some other considerations that should be taken into account when selecting working, working fluid other than the temperature range? Yeah, I can, I, I can take that. That's fine. Um, so I guess the main driver or rule of thumb that I could recommend is there's something called the merit number of a working fluid. So there are several working fluids that kind of coincide with a similar operating temperature range. And, and don't get me wrong, that is really the driver is, you know, you don't want to select water for an operation where you need to transfer heat very efficiently at minus 130 C. Um, so that is the main driver. Uh, the merit number is a good uh, indicator in terms of how well a working fluid is going to be at transferring heat. So the higher the merit number, essentially the more power that it can carry for the same diameter of heat pipe. So if you're looking at ammonia, or let me do a different one, water versus methanol, you know, there is some temperature range that coincides between the two. Um, however, the merit number for uh, water is about 10x higher. Um, so it's able to do 10x the amount of power, so a quarter inch water heat pipe versus quarter inch methanol, uh, largely able to, to carry significantly more power with the water. And additionally, one other thing to take into consideration is the surface tension of a fluid, which also drives the merit number, however, um, strictly from a static wicking height perspective. So if you have an application on the ground, you need to test six inches against gravity, water is going to do much better than methanol would. And those things will also drive um, things like how much heat flux it can move. And maybe the only other consideration worth mentioning is if, um, if you do have overlapping fluids, the, the compatible envelope materials. So there is some mass considerations in what envelope it works with and fluids, uh, various fluids aren't supported. They might generate gas over time in certain envelopes. So you do wanna make sure that you have the ideal fluid plus envelope. But as Ryan said, the fluid is really gonna drive the decision-making process based on the uh, the temperature and design requirements. All right, thank you. So Brian, you'd mentioned about heat flux. And from my own experience, I know that heat flux is becoming a challenging design point at the component level. Could you describe how heat pipes are used in this situation? Yeah, sure. Um, you probably know better than I do, um, having to design these type of things. But um, yeah, the, the heat flux or the, the drive to higher heat flux capabilities within heat pipes is really been driven industry-wide by the amount of electronics going on board spacecraft and the amount of onboard processing required. 
So those two kind of trends to have more capabilities on the spacecraft are requiring um, more powerful electronics, which drives larger waste heats, and they try to package everything as small as possible, so that drives the heat flux. Um, and then as far as handling that heat flux, you need to kind of select the appropriate working fluid and design everything around that so that you can spread it out um, and have lower heat flux going into your higher level assemblies that might not have the capabilities to, to deal with those high heat flux, localized high, high heat flux areas. All right, so now we've used heat pipe to move it away from the component level uh, and to the surface of the box. What's next? Uh, I can take that. So it, I guess it kind of depends first and foremost, what what box are we referring to? Because if you're in kind of the CubeSat uh, realm of satellite, that box, uh, the enclosure could actually just be the radiator panel or the external panel of the spacecraft, in which case, you know, you're looking to actually radiate that uh, uh, that waste heat from the surface that you're transferring it to. So then it becomes important to then get an efficient or effective uh, spreading across that panel, and in some cases, tying it thermally to adjacent panels so that you get enough surface area for dissipation. Um, in some of the larger satellites where the enclosure is more on a payload deck, um, and you know, you want to spread it across the surface of the box so that it can interface with typically CCHBs uh, if it needs to take that waste heat and move it a fairly large distance. Um, so spreading it gets the heat flux low enough that CCHBs and their axially grooved wick structure can, can receive it. They will transfer that uh, to the radiator panel and in some cases you'll, you'll also uh, embed CCHPs into the panel to help get, again, an efficient um, panel, very, very mm -hmm. uniform temperature. And in some cases, you know, you want to link CCHPs to a loop heat pipe, which you see some benefit kind of deploy, deployable applications. Yeah, maybe we can look at some hardware because uh, people don't want to look at us. We've been talking a lot, but um, so, yeah, we talked about spreading heat at local heat flux. Um, this is kind of a, a standard 6U card and um, the heat spreader, <clears throat> a fairly common heat spreader. And in space applications, you usually want to design it with some lightweight material. So this is an aluminum heat spreader, and you can see weight reduction pockets cut into it to further lower the, the heat. But in many applications, you're going to have high heat flux zones where your electronics are. And in this case, we're using copper water heat pipes to take that heat from the localized um, component out to the sidewall. And then we're also spreading it along the wall. So that's where it, it lowers the heat flux into the higher level chassis, um, which would then interface with either a radiator or some other form of, of heat transfer. So yeah, give an idea of kind of the form factors and some of the capabilities to embed copper water heat pipes into, into a heat spreader to again, handle those high heat flux localized um, cooling challenges. All right, so Ryan, you talked a little bit about a couple system level heat pipes there, uh, as opposed to the component level heat pipes. Could one of you touch a little bit more on our ammonia CCHPs or constant conductance heat pipes? Brian, could you go into some details about these maybe? Um, sure, sure. I'll maybe talk to some of the, the design mechanical details and, and Ryan, maybe you can touch on some of the, the theory or principles behind it. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll again go to go to some hardware here. One of the the big advantages of um, of ammonia heat pipes is the versatility. So these are used by designers to take heat from specific components to different areas of of the spacecraft, basically wherever they have some surface area to to dissipate it. So you can see in this example, three D configuration, we can pick up heat at some of these flanges. Um, and then we could drop it off at, at an alternate flange. So in this case, this was likely the, the heat generating component down here, and then it had three condenser surfaces which mounted to a radiator up here. But you could basically utilize any area of your spacecraft by bending and routing the, the pipe. And then to give some idea how we, we go about that and get all the mounting surfaces, this is an example of a, we call it the tic-tac-toe extrusion but basically gives you, we'll, we'll extrude this um, and then we'll turn it into a heat pipe. And if you have mounting surfaces on multiple sides of your heat pipe, you'll basically machine away anywhere that you don't want additional flanges. So you can have this 
as a flange, you could have this as a flange, and all the way around. So really, you can mount to any area of that heat pipe. So when you do have those 3D configurations, you can go about it and have the lightest mass solution, because you're going to machine away anywhere you don't need it, and only have flange surface where you need it for mechanical attachment and, and thermal performance. Yeah, that was great. Um, I want to just take a pause, and I know this isn't why you're here, but uh, this was one of my first jobs here. I bent this, and I'll tell you, this was, <laughs> it looks crazy. This is very exact. Um, <laughs> no, but talking to some of the physics, I guess um, one of the main benefits and how it can carry so much power, and I've already talked about ground test considerations, but um, the typical wick structure for these systems is axially grooved um, wick structure, and I won't show you because John just sat down. So um, <laughs> it has a very large uh, volume for liquid to return back to the evaporator. Um, and that allows it to carry a lot of power in a microgravity uh, or zero G environment. However, because it has teeth that help bring the heat into the system uh, very intermittently, I would say, um, it's not able to receive a high heat flux from the, the components. So where the copper water has more of a wick or a centered powder structure with a lot of nucleation sites, the CCHP kind of is, is inhibited by its, its wick structure, which provides a lot of benefit in a lot of places we want to see. Uh, but you want to keep it in the 5 to 15 watts per centimeter squared region uh, for that technology. Yeah, the wick does allow it to move very long distances. So that's the big benefit to it. How, what was the longest heat pipe you've built? Oh, boy. Um, oh. 15, 16 feet, something like that. Yeah, so they can get pretty long. It's it's a yeah, nice technology for those type of things, and especially on the large set, um, and then on the small set with embedding into radiators and getting um, optimal performance. Absolutely. All right, so pretending I'm a design engineer for one of our customers, what type of information do I need to know when looking to implement one of these CCHPs into one of my systems? Um, so I think I alluded to some of that. Uh, one of the main uh, requirements is the heat flux that you're interfacing to. So again, they have the axially grooved wick structure, which I won't go into too much detail. You can Google it. It's all over the internet. Uh, it does inhibit the amount of heat flux that you can see at the wall, the CCHP, to keep it underneath the boiling limit. So I said 5 to 15 watts per centimeter squared. Just to be safe, I would say keep it at 5 watts per centimeter squared or lower. And if you're in excess of that, figure out an additional means of spreading before getting it into the liquid and vapor of that system. Um, and as I've talked to for at least one other question is uh, the temperature range. Um, so you want to know what temperature range you're operating in. If you're very warm, if you're kind of on the chip side, and it's a low enough heat flux that a CCHP could be used, but it wants to operate at 90, 80 or 90 C, you know, you might want to think about copper water. Uh, the only other consideration, I would say, CCHPs, for as elegant as they are uh, and as efficient at transferring heat as they are, might not uh, necessarily be the best option uh, for your application. So there are some, uh, some uh, heat pipes that are capable of transferring heat very well in one direction, not the other. So that's helpful for survival or preventing the radiator panel from making things too hot. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, variety of heat pipes available. All right, so I know we talked a little bit about uh, CCHPs being external or embedded into radiator panels. Is there any differences from an engineering perspective that one should be aware of when looking at these areas? Sure. Um, we alluded a little, a little bit to the flange design. So that's one area um, on an external mounted parts. You want kind of a larger flange to give you more surface area to get the heat into the heat pipe and give you more ability to, to mount it easier. Um, one other area for consideration is the fact that it's going to be fully embedded. Um, so the the coating or, or surface treatment might be a little different in a in a deep space environment or an external. You typically is designed into like um, sometimes bare aluminum, but sometimes a, a chem film or or something that's a little more corrosion resistant and those type of um, applications. In the embedded, we actually have one here. Um, embedded pipes typically get something that's going to be very good for adhesion to the, the panel face sheets. So this is actually a BR-127 coating you see here. Um, nice, nice, pretty yellow-green color. 
and that gets uh, kind of placed into the panels and it promotes very good uh, bonding when they do the, the uh, final pressing of the panel to the, to the pipes. So the other considerations in, in terms of CCHPs are kind of at the system level when you're talking about embedded panels. Um, you need to understand kind of the honeycomb structure as well as the facie material and make sure you design everything appropriately and have you know place for um, inserts and those type of things which are, are typical in system level design. So that's why even though they're embedded and straight, straight heat pipes might make the most sense um, thermally, you, you end up with designs that have you know two-dimensional, pretty elaborate two-dimensional shapes to them. Okay, now circling back to our system level heat pipes, another technology that we mentioned were loop heat pipes, LHPs. When, when considering the use of LHPs over a CCHP or just a traditional space cop water pipe, um, what are some things to take into consideration? Um, so the loop heat pipe does very well in certain applications. So as I, as I alluded to before, um, deployables. So if you're trying to transfer heat across, you know, a region of the spacecraft that's actuating, if you're deploying deploying your, your radiator panels, um, we can implement flexible transport lines directly into the assembly. So it's able to actuate without causing any damage or, uh, you know, plastic deformation in the system and risk failure. Um, the loop heat pipe doesn't have necessarily the same limitation as a CCHP in terms of heat flux. Um, at the evaporator because instead of an axially grooved wick structure, it actually has a centered powder wick structure uh, traditionally. So it can receive, you know, 40, 50 watts per centimeter squared in lieu of the five that I stated before. Um, the loop heat pipe is also very good for thermal control uh, in both directions. So it, it has a very low thermal resistance whenever it's operating. So you can move a lot of heat uh, with a very low delta T. Um, yeah, I think that's the majority of it. <laughs> oh yeah, I can show you it. I actually have one by me. They're so kind as to bring it. Uh, so this is this is a nifty one I'm probably going to talk about here a little bit later, but you have your evaporator here. It's got a centered powder uh, wick structure, so it's able to receive a lot of heat, a lot of areas of nucleation. Traditionally, it wants to evaporate at the interface of the wick and the wall there. Vapor departs goes through the condenser and comes back as traditionally a subcooled liquid into the compensation chamber. We'll get a little bit more into the physics of that. And the next question, um, I will say it's a very attractive technology um, from all the variety of things it can accomplish. A good designer in general is gonna try and uh, find the simplest solution possible for both cost, lead time, and risk uh, purposes. Uh, loop heat pipe is, is generally speaking, more expensive and longer longer to fabricate than a CCHP. So uh, I will caution you with that. Well, with that, could you provide some scenarios where you would specifically want to consider an uh, LHP as opposed to some other system? Sure. So outside of the heat flux, which I feel like I've touched on a lot, I think it's important to understand the physics of how exactly a, a loop heat pipe operates. So just really quickly, you have your evaporator, have your compensation chamber. Your compensation chamber actually is what sets the operating uh, pressure temperature of the system. So there is wick only within the, the pump body here, so in the evaporator and in the compensation chamber. There's no wick anywhere else. So the only way that you're moving vapor and returning liquid is by the pressure difference created between the compensation chamber and the evaporator. So what that means is the compensation chamber needs to operate colder than the evaporator to complete that cycle. So if you are trying to prevent your loop heat pipe and the components that are attached to the evaporator from getting too cold, you can put a small heater on the compensation chamber and with one, two watts, increase the temperature of the compensation chamber until it's at least as warm as the evaporator. You no longer have that pressure differential driving the flow through the loop and everything shuts down, and then the only conduction or uh, I guess heat transfer to the radiator panels largely is just conduction through the transport line, which can be very long, um, so a very inefficient path for that. And on the hot side, as, I, as I've said, there's no wick in the condenser, there's no wick in the transport lines, 
So let's say your electronics are off, still attached to the evaporator, your radiator panel starts seeing direct sunlight heating up. Instead of that causing the loop heat pipe to heat up and the electronics with it, all the liquid that's in the condenser line actually vaporizes, comes into the evaporator body compensation chamber, and then again, you just have heat gains, I guess in that case, from the radiator panel via conduction through these lines, which again is, is very poor. And a lot of times, um, <clears throat> what loop heat pipe might be the ideal solution when you're, you're thinking about high power loads and deployability, so you need those flexible lines. Yep. Um, one of the challenges with it is the evaporator body can only be so big. So if you're dealing with something that has a lot of discrete heat loads, um, you need to collect all that heat to the loop heat pipe evaporator body, and that's where the things like CCHPs kind of are, are working in tandem, bring all the heat collected, and then let the loop heat pipe do all the, the fun, exciting, complex stuff it does to, to move all the heat, add deployability to your radiators, um, and then couple the entire radiators with its long um, condenser lines. All right. So we're running a little low on time, and I want to make sure we get to audience questions at the end. So let's touch on one more type of heat pipe. Uh, could one of you describe when you might consider a variable conductance heat pipe, heat pipe or VCHP? Sure. Um, variable conductance heat pipes are another another fun uh, variation. So VCHPs are used, and if you're seeing the figure here, um, they're they're used kind of as a almost like a spring. Um, so in a very in, in the top figure, you're seeing the, the high heat power setting. Um, the um, fluid is pushing, the, the power and pressure is pushing the fluid such that it pushes all the gas into a reservoir. So the difference between a constant conductance and a variable conductance is that you're introducing non-condensable gas, um, but when you're operating in, in your high power mode or um, worst case operation, higher temperature mode, you're going to push all the gas into the reservoir and you're going to operate your entire surface area as active condenser. In another scenario, if your heat's lower and you don't want to um, overcool it, you, you might want to shut down a portion of the condenser. So in this scenario, that is when your gas front actually expands out and it shuts down a portion of your condenser so that you're actually radiating less heat um, to deep space and allowing the temperature to be controlled at the evaporator. So this is used in a lot in space vehicles that are limited on power, and you want to kind of save heater power, because in most of these applications, to keep the electronics from, um, keep them surviving long term, you need to make sure that you're not overcooling them in, in the low temperature setting. So a VCHP is a nice way to, to do that and reduce your survival power needed to keep your electronics from overcooling. So VCHPs are often used to reduce uh, heater power control temperatures to specific components in the line. Uh, Ryan, could you give the audience some sense of what's possible in terms of bandwidth of control temperatures and require heat power to allow that type of control in the system? Sure, I'll take a, take a swag at it. <clears throat> so um, one important consideration is you get the level of thermal control you'll have at the evaporator is a direct function of the volume of gas that you have available. So basically what that means is the larger the reservoir is, uh, the tighter the, I'd say, the switching range from active condenser to fully closed condenser will be. Um, so assuming you have the mass and volume allotments, you can get, you know, on the order of plus minus a couple degrees uh, Celsius at the evaporator. And it would probably take collectively, again, this is all very, uh, <laughs> rough order of magnitude values here. It depends on lengths, what materials you're using, et cetera. But you could be on the order of five, five watts between split between the reservoir, which also assists in getting tight thermal control, and uh, the evaporator where you're trying to maintain the temperature of all, all your electronics components, uh, which is fairly significant whenever you think a CCHP could be trying to constantly transfer you know, 100 plus watts. Uh, five to 100 is a significant reduction there. All right. So one last question before we get into the audience, audience uh, questions. Heat pipes have been around for decades, and here at ACT, we always say innovation in action. So are there new any innovations in heat pipes after such a long time in the market? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I'd say we probably have, I don't know, two dozen or three dozen papers on our website about um, space heat pipes. Um, we, our R&D department does a lot in that, that realm. And as we talked about earlier, there's going to be a lot of need for them as we start expanding our mission profiles and can start surviving longer in space. Um, so yeah, some of the interesting ones I'll maybe touch on real quick. Um, along the lines of variable conductance heat pipes, I'm, I am somewhat of a fan of kind of how that technology is evolving. So there's, we talked about one scenario where the reservoir is at the condenser end and it's a cold reservoir setup, but there's also ways to control temperature um, even more precise and have some other benefits by having a hot reservoir, which is currently being, um, being developed and emerging through the, the TRL ranks. Um, another area is <clears throat> um, a thermomodulating heat pipe, which is something we're developing with the Air Force Research Lab, and that's more of a, a variant for less thermal control, still some thermal control, but less, but a more um, conducive design for satellite architectures and, and lower cost manufacturing. So those are a couple of fun VCHP ones. And then um, one of my favorite ones just to, to read about and, and say that we've done this is um, the Venus lander heat pipes. Sure. So the, those are operating in very extreme environments of Venus um, using liquid metal as a temperature. And it's actually um, also variable conductance and thermal control. So there's a lot of bells and whistles and unique technology that goes into that. Um, if you have time, get on our website, check out the paper. Uh, a lot of fun stuff there. Absolutely. And I guess mine, uh, more of a, a technology would be 3D printing. So we have been actively working 3D printing wick structures uh, for some time now. And one of the main developments that we're looking to make is actually 3D printed uh, loop heat pipes. So they serve to try and address, I'll say right now, at least two major challenges of traditional loop heat pipe fabrication. So one would be uh, the wick insertion. Brian already talked to, there's a physical limitation of how long you can get an evaporator. That's largely because getting that centered wick structure into the evaporator is actually a thermal uh, thermal interference fit. So, you know, if you have an 18 inch long evaporator, an 18 inch long wick, you heat the body and cool the wick to the point you have about 0 0.01 inches worth of a gap. So any misalignment makes it very challenging and it actually causes us to carry a significant quantity of spares of both the body and the wicks, which then increase time to fabricate and cost. Um, and the other limitation is the knife edge insertion, uh, which is continuously fl flagged as basically a high risk operation or feature of loop heat pipes. And its sole purpose is to prevent vapor from going backwards and again, causing the full system to shut down via heat leak. Um, so I actually, you probably noticed I've been fiddling with this the whole time because I'm, you know, I fidget. Uh, this is actually one of the 3D printed uh, loop heat pipe wick structures. So what we do is we 3D print the primary wick itself. This is all stainless. We print a sleeve outside of it. So it's, you know, it's already got the envelope material in it. And because we can 3D print solid surfaces, we no longer have a need of doing a, a very invasive knife edge seal. We can print that directly. So it reduces the risk for all those processes. We're even able to get the little vapor grooves that allow what you're vaporizing on the outside here to travel to your vapor line. Um, so that all being said, drastically reduces the amount of time and thus cost um, for us to fabricate a loop heat pipe. There are some obvious limitations, one of which we've only demonstrated this in stainless to date. Um, so you're gonna lose some, uh, conductance in your system as the, you know, it's not a very conductive element. And then also as the uh, 3D printing is uh, limited by technology, we can't get a small uh, pore radii. So a, let's say conventional loop heat pipe can have a one micron primary wick structure, which allows it to carry a lot of power. Um, this is probably in the order of six to eight uh, times larger than that. So it can't do quite as much power, but we have been able to still demonstrate several hundred watts of power with a 3D printed uh, loop heat pipe and, and I believe ammonia working fluid. Yeah, and I think I like that one a lot too. Um, but I think it does open up a lot of extra space from a satellite design standpoint because loops are really only considered when you have extreme powers, extreme distances involved because of how cost and schedule prohibitive they are. But a lot of times the bottleneck in a spacecraft system is um, thermal straps. 
you can't use heat pipes because you need some relative motion between two bodies. So you use a thermal strap, um, which relies on the material conductivity. And there are better thermal conductivity materials than some of the base metals, but this is a really nice technology that can kind of fill that gap. So lower, lower powers, but you can move it, you can have a flexible joint, and you can create those thermal links in those areas, um, which I think will really help the, uh, the industry and some of the designers to increase local power um, with areas that they can't couple to radiators very easily. All right, that's a lot of good information, gentlemen. Now let's move into some of our audience questions. So the first one I have here, what does a customer's thermal design expert, or thermal expert design versus what does ACT design? And what kind of interface do you have between the customer and ACT in that regard? Sure. Um, yeah, I'd say the the answer there is very very broad. We've taken on um, completes, you know, throw everything over the table to us, and and we'll work with you as far as how we evolve it. Everything from, um, you know, component selection, technology selection, um, doing the detailed thermal analysis, mechanical structural analysis, make sure everything's going to survive the flight, shock and vibe, prototyping, testing. Um, so we really have done the entire gambit, and it's really a matter of what our customers' capabilities are and, and what they're comfortable with. Um, but I, I'd say the the benefit of working with ACT in those kind of long-term development projects is is the communication. So um, yeah, Ryan had to take some time out of his day today to to do a webinar, but it's very hard to get a hold of this guy because he's he's on a lot of different uh, design reviews and meetings with customers. But we do like to have almost weekly or bi-weekly cadence on some of those more complex programs to, to really make sure that we're progressing and working with our customers to come up with the, the ideal solution. So as we kind of went through the, the heat pipe selection only here, you could see a lot of the trade-offs. They have implications on a lot of the various components, system level components. And our goal as a, as a thermal provider is, is really to make an ideal solution for, for our customer. So that's where we want to have close communication and make sure that um, anything we design is going to be um, a benefit and overall optimization to the to the space vehicle and and not just the the ideal thermal solution. Yeah, I think the best way I like to think of it is is we're kind of we fill the gap. We exist to fill the gap in your capability. So whether you need us to come on as your full thermal arm and it's still you know not a sophisticated system, it's just not a either a capability or expertise you have in house or you're just overloaded you know, we can shoulder that burden. Or if you're trying to introduce a new piece of technology that you're not familiar with to the system, uh, we're also very good at navigating existing uh, architecture and plugging in what makes sense and, and kind of giving you the answers you're looking for. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much. So we'll head on to the next question now. Do you see applications where you are storing excess heat generation for recirculation for thermal regulation? Do you have spacecraft that have thermally isolated internal heat sinks at all? Oh boy, it's um, a good question. I, I think there's a specific application here we should probably talk about. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's a couple different ways I can take this question. Suffice it to say yes, uh, I think we have experienced <laughs> that. Um, I'm trying to understand if you're talking Really isolating. If you're talking like a like a VCHP type application, we also have uh, phase change material experience in implementing that into spacecraft, which is essentially a thermal uh, capacitor or battery. So it's able to absorb energy and dissipate that over more uh, time average duration. Um, yeah, I, I would need to understand more about your application. Yeah, and with both those technologies, again, it comes down to the trade space. So whether you're moving a lot of power and your duty cycle or on off time is is significant, or you're just trying to isolate a single component, um, it, it's yeah, it's an interesting application, and and those are yeah two technologies probably worth considering there. All right, and just a reminder for our audience, we will be touching base with any questions we do not get to or any that we need to go into further detail just to save time and get to as many as we can. So on to the next question. Regarding growing food or plants in space, are there any pipe systems that could be used for regulating or providing heat to a quote unquote growing chamber? I don't 
I'm going to be honest. I don't know mm. anything about those, uh, the growing chambers in space. I'm a, I'm a simple man. You tell me, you know, <laughs> temperatures and the amount of waste heat, and I will tell you how to get it there. Um, I would say if, yeah, there's a, an issue is either moving, storing, spreading uh, heat, even regulating temperature to a certain extent, then, yeah, there's, there's likely a solution that, that exists in that trade space that, um, that we could help point you towards. Um, again, I think just in, in the form of boundary conditions. So, uh, great question. I'm going to have to read up on that. <laughs> All right. Next question. What happens if three or more heat sources change the working mode of the system? For example, when there are three heat sources in line and the middle one is off, how does that influence the overall efficiency or operation of the system? These are, these are very specific questions. I like the, the audience here. Um, yeah, in, in most cases, if, um, if you're dealing with three different components using a single thermal solution, let's say a single constant conductance heat pipe, um, the goal is basically to design for worst case and have additional capacity for the other use cases. So a heat pipe can pick up discrete heat loads from multiple locations. It'll vaporize kind of locally, but it'll still do the, the heat transport and condense on the condenser end and bring the fluid back uh, to cool down all three of the components. And so you're designing for worst case, all of them being on. And then when one goes off, you're going to have excess capacity in the pipe so it can move more power than you're putting into it. But your thermal resistance is going to be relatively similar. So you're going to move the heat and you're going to cool down the components at a, at a relatively similar rate you would if all three were on. Um, but you just have a little extra capacity in, in terms of how much heat you can move in those scenarios. Yep. It's all a pressure drop driven system. Vapor wants to go to where the pressure is lowest, which is your condenser. Um, it will be probably, yeah, I agree, similar. It depends on what the power densities of each of them are. Very common application. Great question. Um, I will say whenever you have three of them on, the one that's furthest away from the condenser is going to be a bit warmer than whenever you have the middle one off because that middle one's not there preheating essentially any, um, any working fluid that's trying to wind yeah. its way to that third unit. All right. I think we have time for one more question before we... Uh, one or two more questions before we end here. So the next one uh, we have, can heat pipe be used in a cryogenic application? We've talked a lot about heat pipes, but it's been more plus or minus uh, zero C for the temperature applications. For example, connecting the cold tip of a cryo cooler to a component on a payload. Yes, yeah, again, and I think that's where you're starting to get into like more of the methane um, temperature range of heat pipe. That is something that uh, that I believe has been done. Heat pipes have been flight proven for cryogenic applications uh, at this point. Yeah. yeah, it's not common that we see those type of requirements, um, but it certainly can be can be done. Might take a little more development than like a, a straightforward ammonia pipe. Um, but yeah, those are challenges that are always interesting and fun. All right, and last question for the day. For highly dissipating power electronics, what trends are we seeing in terms of liquid choices? How often do we use just one heat pipe or are we sort of chaining heat pipe systems together? Um, well, I think that that is the exact, uh, I guess, development that kind of led everyone to start using. And by everyone, I mean, there's, it's just now emerging, but <laughs> copper water heat pipes in their system, right? So, um, the water has high surface tension, which does contribute to a higher boiling uh, limit. It also uses a different wick structure that is capable of providing more areas of nucleation. So we already started seeing the transition away from using either aluminum ammonia or more likely just conduction-based uh, thermal pads from components to the, the surface of the box, as the one question had. Um, and there's, I'm always a big fan of N plus one redundancy. So chaining heat pipes together, if you're meaning almost like a dual bore of a heat pipe, um, I'm generally a pretty big proponent of it. I don't like single stranding things, but I can't say uh, that we see too many applications where that's a, a necessity uh, because of high, high heat flux. I definitely see it 
developing in that direction, but I don't know that we've gotten to that point just yet. Yeah, and like almost all the the answers we're going to respond to, it's it's a trade study in in almost all cases. So whether to um, put two heat pipes that are kind of connecting at evaporator condenser end, or one longer heat pipe that might be a larger diameter, um, mass trade offs, performance trade offs, and those kind of all need to be done at their early on stages, but. There's a lot of options, and that's why that's why heat pipes. Um, we get so many questions on heat pipes because they're so so versatile. But um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good questions here, and yeah, if you provide more specifics, we'd be happy to answer them in more detail because there, there's usually a kind of an ideal or optimal, but it it you need to get a little into the weeds to figure it out. All right. So, could you talk a little bit about how? You might go from a space copper heat pipe to maybe a CCHP or an LHP or something like that. Is that sort of commonality that we're seeing nowadays? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Again, we're we're seeing the space copper water be used in some of the larger satellites. So again, it's still more on the uh, the box level. And actually, there's a nice nice image on the slide there, courtesy of uh, of BAE Systems, showing exactly what I just said about single stranding. So. Uh, single copper water heat pipe grabbing on one of their, their processors there for their RAD 5545 board. Um, so that's a great application. Um, again, that heat pipe is spreading the heat across the rail there, which then gets transferred to the sidewall of the chassis, which presumably is uh, cold on the bottom on a payload deck that links to CCHP. So by the time the heat gets from uh, the chip to the base of the chassis, it's generally much more uniformly distributed, much lower heat flux, and able to be received by CCHPs. Um, we also have, I believe, a patent involving um, combining heat pipes and integrating them directly into uh, aluminum ammonia CCHPs. So if you have very discrete loads that traditionally can't be handled uh, just by directly interfacing them to a CCHP, we do have the capability to machine effectively grooves in a flange of a CCHP and solder copper water heat pipes directly in there. They spread it in plane before it gets into the vapor to uh, an extent where the CCHP can receive it. Yeah, so a very kind of simple way to think about it is the closer you are to the component itself, the higher heat flux you need to handle, that's where water is more appropriate. Water is not never gonna be kind of a system level solution where you're moving it meters. Um, so localized heat spreading for, for a copper water, and then system level where you need to move at significant distances, that's where your ammonia heat pipes come into play, and then the difference between a loop and a constant conduct is it's mainly based on um, power control, performance, um, any deployability, as, as Ryan's alluding to there very well. Uh, yeah, so a lot, again, a lot, of, a lot of trades and considerations. All right, I think that's about all the time we have. Ryan, Brian, thank you. Brian, sorry for mispronouncing your last name with being, no matter how, no matter how many times I try to <laughs> uh, practice it. But uh, anyone who we did not get to, we will get to your questions after the fact via email or phone or uh, whatever the best way to contact you is. And thank you for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for your help here, Rick Danger Jones. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thanks, everyone.